Well, hello there, deal makers, and welcome to the Apartment Building Investing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Blanc, and I'm super excited that you're here. Today, we have uh, one of the awesome favorite stories about someone who has quit their job with multifamily real estate. And I'm so excited to have Krista Wilper on the show today. And her story is super cool because she's a mom of three boys and she was an executive at an alcohol company. I can't believe she left that job and free alcohol, really? My gosh. So she just talks about her story of her leaving her executive position with this alcohol company and the limiting beliefs that she had, the conversation she had with her husband and who agreed to this uh, this unbelievable plan of leaving her job. So she really loves the psychology and motivation of people's really talk about limiting beliefs and why people some take action and why she took action and why she didn't just coast through life. And it was, it's a really fascinating story of uh, someone really against all odds. I mean, as you know, a working, working mom, especially with three boys, essentially have two full-time jobs. And how did she manage to build this up on the side? It's really a great you know, testament to anyone who says, I don't have any time. Well, she had very little time and she got it done anyway. So let's get, uh, let's get right into the interview here with Krista Wilper. Here we go. All right. If you haven't done so already, grab your tickets for Dealmaker Live. It's going to be the multifamily event of the year, and you're going to hear from famous people, people you've never heard from, people you've never heard before. But the whole point is to help you become a better deal maker. And so we're going to have people that have done their first deals, people who have quit their jobs, and we want to know how did they do it so that you can do it as well. So check it out, dealmakerliveevent.com is where you can grab tickets. And I would suggest you do it now because we're probably going to sell out long before the event is up. Uh, we capped it at 500 like we did last year. And we were sold out last year. And so now a year has gone by. So I highly recommend you guys grab your tickets while you still can. We have, uh, my gosh, all kinds of people. Robert Helms with Real Estate Guys. We have Brandon Turner from Bigger Pocket speaking. Joe Farrell is going to be there. It is going to be awesome and magical. So make sure you guys grab your tickets. All right. Now, I'm, I'm sure excited at the, as you are about learning more about Krista's story of a full-time mom, full-time executive, and leaving that job to pursue real estate full-time. Let's get right into her story with Krista Wolf. <laughs> Krista, welcome to the show today. Thank you. I am so excited and flattered to be here ever since our first uh, phone call and connection. I've really been looking forward to today, so I'm very, very happy to be here. Well, anytime someone quits their job with multifamily real estate, uh, you know, they're a candidate for the for the show because people want to understand how you did that, and uh, and that's why you're on the show. And I, I kind of, I want to start right away. I want you to think back on your your first day when you quit your job. What was that day like? Uh, well, I'll tell you actually a little bit before I quit my job. I was probably one of the lucky ones. I was one of the 15 percent that loved my job. Now, granted, I worked in the alcohol industry, so it was a, it's a fun industry and you had free booze. So there were some good perks, but, uh, honestly, I loved my job. I loved to work. I loved the people that I worked with and it was this tennis game inside my head. I mean, it was back and forth on, I'm going to quit my job and then no, I can, I can see this through our forecasts are tremendous. I'm going to, I'm going to make this work back to, I'm going to quit my job. And it was this battle for, uh, for months, honestly, for a long time. And then once we, we finally made the decision and some opportunities presented themselves within our household and really just said that, yes, this was the direction that I was supposed to go. Um, so once we made that decision, it was a full on commitment to make this happen. And we're grateful that through our real estate investments, we were able to, to do this, to walk away from a corporate executive position with minimal impact into our, our household finances. Yeah, I, I would be, uh, you know, I would, I would be hard pressed to leave a, a job that provides free alcohol, Krista. So uh, kudos to you. Uh, what was, <laughs> what did your people around you? How did they react? Your coworkers, your friends, your family, your neighbors? Like, what was their reaction to this? Um, I get told that I'm crazy a lot, which is great. I take that as a compliment. And honestly, leaving the alcohol industry, the alcohol industry is one of those industries that's very economically resilient. When things are going well in the economy, business is good. When things are going bad in the economy, business is probably better. Um, so a lot of people thought that I was crazy. I had a great career path. I had great opportunities in front of me. Uh, I was on a really good track and people thought that I, were, I was crazy to walk away from that, which 
in a lot of ways I was, like I said, things looked, the, the forecast looked really good and things were in a really good position. My husband wasn't too excited because I was kind of his retirement plan. And then I threw a curveball. but I knew, um, I knew for us and for my family, for my marriage, for my kids, for our lifestyle, I knew that I needed to make a change. So once, like I said, once I made that decision to walk away, uh, it was really, really easy. And now I wouldn't go back for anything. Yeah. A lot of times we find people um, who say they want to quit their job. They didn't maybe sign up for a program and do a certain thing. And then they kind of fall away from the wayside. And I, we've seen that if you're, you know, if the person's plan B ain't so bad, it's a really strong force that will uh, suck someone back into what is ever their status quo. And it's particularly difficult in a situation where someone like you has a great job, great family, you know, and it makes it difficult to walk away from kind of a sure thing. What was it in your mind? Why did you feel you were justified in walking away from a good thing? Well, for us, we, we built our portfolio on single family homes. So we, we already had established single family homes that we were managing and, and building that on the side while both of us were working. We weren't cash flowing out of those properties, not because the properties weren't producing, but simply because we didn't expand our lifestyle and we didn't, we didn't need that. We both had stable incomes. We both had good jobs. We had the money that we needed to support our lifestyle. We didn't grow from that. So when I needed that change, I had, a, I had a, a commute across town. We live outside of Denver, outside of the, the foothills, up in the foothills in the mountains. And Colorado legalized marijuana and everyone decided to move here and my commute got even worse. And so that was putting a tremendous amount of pressure on our household and our environment and all the different roles and responsibilities of being a mom. We have three children. Um, of being an executive and, and fulfilling the needs in that role. And so there was just a lot of stress that were, was around that. And when I felt that I needed this change and we started looking at our real estate portfolio, it became very easy, right? We looked at it and I said, if we started cash flowing out of these properties that we would, I would be able to walk away. We wouldn't have a huge impact into our finances within the home. And so I knew for me to have everything that I needed and to have more balance in my life, to have the time, to have the flexibility, to be more engaged with our children, more engaged with my husband and within our marriage, I knew it was an easy decision to walk away. And I knew that I wouldn't look back and, and regret that. I'm not going to lay on my deathbed wishing I would have worked more hours at my corporate job, right? I'm going to lay there and think, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I wish I would have spent more time with my children when they were growing up. I wish I would have impacted more people in a significant way. And this provided all of those opportunities to make that happen. So, so create some color here. Let's, let's be a little more specific, Krista, about you talking about lack of life balance. Your job was very stressful with your marriage. Can you talk about some stories or examples that kind of brought, I suppose, the problem to light? Sure. We have um, a, our youngest. Our, we have three boys. So our youngest was probably around five at the time. And he is the most stubborn little boy. And I know exactly where he gets it. So him and I butt heads uh, tremendously. So I would come home. The alcohol industry is great, but there's a lot of complexity there. So there's, you're fighting fires a lot during the day. You're managing exceptions and it takes a lot of energy and effort. And on top of that, I would have a very stressful commute all the way across back across town to make sure I could get home in time to get the kids off the bus or what have you. So by the end of the day, I was exhausted and I would come home and I would not have the energy to discipline this very stubborn child of ours. So my husband would then have to step in and do some of the discipline with this, this youngster. And that would put then stress between him and I, because I didn't have the energy to do it. And I would take the easy road and be like, yes, you can have whatever you want. I don't care. I'm just exhausted. I, I need to go to bed. Um, and so it puts stress between our relationship and our dynamic because it constantly put the pressure on my husband to play that disciplinary role and it, a household doesn't thrive in that environment. Right. Yeah, I gotcha. So, so, so interesting. So what was your conversation like with your husband? You mentioned earlier that he was kind of a, an unwilling victim in this kind of decision. And it reminds me of the conversation that I had with, uh, with my wife when I declared I was going to quit my job as well. Yeah. What was that conversation like with him? Well, this is the story I tell is that I, I came home one day and I said I was going to quit my job. It really is not that clear cut. There was, there was many, many conversations around this. Uh, and looking at our finances and looking at our properties and making sure that this would make sense. Like I said, he was probably a little disappointed because I love to work and I was on a great career path and he thought, you know, 
five more years and maybe he could retire and we would life would be good. And I definitely threw the curveball and said, I'm going to, I'm going to leave this opportunity. I'm going to leave my job and put all of my time and effort into real estate and build that portfolio. And I will get you out in three to five years. I will get you to retirement in three to five years. And we really went through um, like three different phases kind of through this transition. The first one, uh, like I said, I like to work. So there were some comments about me going back to work and thinking that that may be the route that we go. And I don't think he quite realized how committed I and determined that I am. So I said, no, no I'm, I'm not going back to work. This is the route I'm going. This is the route I'm pursuing. This is, this is happening. And then things, he finally realized that maybe isn't going to happen, that I wasn't going to get a job. Maybe that was closer to the house. So I distinctly remember, and I told him I was going to share this story, but I distinctly remember we had some arguments where maybe he didn't even think it was possible to get him out in three to five years. And so, and that, that hurt, right? That stung me and my belief and kind of created some self-doubt, but we had this distinct conversation where he didn't even know if this was possible on the route we were on. And then you fast forward to now, and now he's like, okay, well, you said three to, you said three to five years and it's been two and a half. So where, where are we at? Are, are we going to make it? What are you doing? What are you working on today? Are we get, we're, I'm ready to go. So we definitely went through a transition phase um, from leaving my job into getting into this environment. But I think he has been very supportive. He's on board. He has seen what we were able to do with our multifamily deals. And like I said, he's ready to go. Yeah, so there's there's so many people who tell me, you know, they want to quit their jobs, and that's like, well, you know, we have a solution for you, and then the, some people just don't take any action whatsoever. Why do you think you took action? Oh, um, I am the type that will. I, I, part of it is comfort zone, and part of it is managing fear. And one of the big things we could probably do an entirely separate podcast on it is managing the inner piece as much as the outer piece. And I think there's some key factors in that. And I think what happens between our two ears in our brain fascinates me. You know, your boss comes into you one day and he's like, hey, I need you to see my, I need, I need you in my office this afternoon. And instantly your mind goes to all of the negative places, right? Oh my God, what did I do? He knows I came in late yesterday. I didn't get that report done. That is instantly where your head goes. And I think you have to work really, really hard to train your brain and to train that muscle and to keep it in the right place and to know that this is gonna work and that this is gonna happen. I think it's, it's a lot like if, when you have, if you have children and they're learning to walk, right? They stumble, they fall down, but they get back up and we encourage them to get back up because we all know that walking is possible, right? We see it ever, we all do it ourselves and we see it every day. And so if you don't surround yourself with people that encourage that it's, you're going to, you're going to start listening to those people and believing those things that the people that tell you it's not true or it's not possible or it's not going to happen. So I think you really have to cut that out and surround yourself and keep yourself in that right. Mind. You know, the fear and the emotion that is tied to money is significant. And I think you have to learn to manage that fear. And I think the best way to do that is to come back to your numbers. So when we were going through our multifamily deal, I mean, I was, I was scared to death. And there was a couple different times where we were about ready to back out and, and back out of the deal and walk away. And every time I got to that point, I would come back to the numbers. And what's nice, the beautiful thing about the numbers is it strips out all of that emotion. So it strips out the excitement around it. It strips out the fear around it. It strips out all of those what ifs around that situation. And if you can run your numbers 18 million different ways, and they still work, then you'd be dumb not to do that deal. And that was the biggest piece for me during our transitioning into multifamily that every time I would get scared, I would go back to our, our spreadsheets and our analysis. And then I would be like, I would be an idiot if I didn't do this deal. Um, but I think it takes work, it takes effort and it takes it every single day. It's not something you can just do on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You know, I listen to motivational videos and uh, podcasts and pieces like that all the time, just to try to keep my mind in the right place. Yeah, that's uh, it's so important. In fact, I remember uh, talking to Grant Cardone and and you know, asking what kind of the secret to success is, and I was like, oh, I thought he was gonna tell me it's it's my Bentley or my plane. <laughs> you know, he said something really boring. He said consistency. It's a consistency. It's doing you know the same little thing every single day over long periods of time. 
And if you look at the successful people in any business, that is exactly what they've what they've done. There's not a giant burst of energy or they do something for a period of time, then they get shiny objectitis or they quit after a setback. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm continually fascinated with people's psychology and motivation because people don't take action or stop taking action for a whole variety of different reasons. It really is. It's interesting, you know, and I wish there was a silver bullet I say, look, if you do, do these these three things for the next X whatever months, you will achieve this outcome. And people decide not to listen to you. They either don't do that, they do something else. Uh, and it's fascinating to me. It sounds like you have a similar fascination with uh, human psychology. It, well, it, to your point, it's a process, right? I think in today's world with all of everything comes instantaneously, right? You get all of your updates and text messages and information is is transferred very, very quickly. And we get into this immediate gratification syndrome and self-improvement, self-development, success doesn't happen overnight. It is a process and you have to be willing to engage in that process and stick with it. And I think the other thing that's really important is having something bigger than yourself that drives that meaning because th things do get hard, things do get scary. And if you don't have something that is deeply rooted within yourself and within that meaning, you're going to quit. You're going to throw in the towel and you're going to walk away. But if you're committed to the process of getting better and you're committed to the process of trying and learning from different things that maybe don't work out and you're in it for the long haul and you come back to that meaning of what is really driving you, it's, it's going to, we're proof, you're proof, I'm proof. It's going to work and it's going to happen and it, it's all possible. Um, I just think that yeah, it's manage again, it's managing that fear and managing that psychology behind it because it's really easy. It's really easy to walk away and it takes a lot of grit and guts and determination to really stick it out and, and believe that the possibility is there. What do you like uh, best about not having your job anymore? Oh man. Uh, besides the obvious, right? So I touched on the fact that as a mother, in society, there are still a lot of roles that stereotypically fall within a woman in the household. And I feel like I have the energy and the time and the balance to better juggle all of those capabilities, whether it's cleaning the house or doing the laundry or running kids to doctor's appointments. Uh, I have the time and the flexibility to do all of that. And I still have the income that's coming in. The other thing that I think is really important is it, it gives you time to focus on how you want to help other people. And I think a lot of people want to do this and want to spend and dedicate some time to that, but they're so busy in the hamster wheel, right? They're so busy in the rat race running from day to day and month to month to make sure that they have enough money coming in to cover the bills. They don't have the time to really reflect and understand on how they're going to make an impact in the world and how they're going to make it a better place. So Having just some of that mental capacity when you're not absorbed in a 40 to 50, 60 hour work week, having some of that mental capacity to really reflect on how you want to make a difference and what you want your life to look like is a huge benefit from not being in the, in the nine to five. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I mean, your, your brain is so consumed with your job and there's no room for anything else. And when you don't have that job, it creates some extra empty space. And I agree with you. Most people in that position uh, you know, they may buy a bunch of stuff and go and travel, but at one point they're going to go, hmm, what else is, should I do? And they tend to gravitate towards uh, how do they help or serve other people. And it sounds like that's kind of happening to you because we've had conversation about, you know, you mentoring and coaching other people and you're, you know, you're already kind of asking those questions. I think that's awesome. Well, like I said, I don't, I, I think what scares me the most, and it's not, it's not failing on a deal. It's not going bankrupt. Right. I mean, yes, I have some of those fears, but we, we manage those. I think what scares me the most is laying on my deathbed and knowing I didn't do as much as I could have to impact other people. And I think that scares me and that motivates me more hmm. than anything else. Yeah, I love that. And of course, yeah, I mean, a, a job, a full time job definitely gets can get in the way of something like that. Uh, tell me, uh, I, I want to get back to that, but tell me about your, your plan. All right. So you had this conversation with your husband and uh, it wasn't a, a single conversation, maybe over some time, but what was your plan moving forward uh, once you left your job? Like what was your initial plan and how did it change? So there were uh, two primary goals. 
One of them was I wanted to double my net income within 12 months of leaving my job. So a combination of obviously growing our investments, cutting expenses, so forth. But that was number one. Number two was to get my husband out and get him into retirement in three to five years. And I broadcasted those everywhere, um, you know, threw them out into the universe, if you will, but also to hold myself accountable so that everybody knew exactly what I was doing. Now, we had built a portfolio of single family homes, but I knew if we were going to make these goals and if this was truly going to happen, I had to be much more sophisticated and I had to be much more strategic in order to get there. So one of the first things I did was I hired coaching. Um, I did hire coaching and realized through that coaching program that I was thinking too small, right? Single family properties weren't going to get me there in three to five years and multifamily made much more sense in order to get us there. Um, the other thing I did was I kind of eliminated all of the people that, this sounds really harsh, but all of the people, the naysayers, right? All the people that said it wasn't very, that it wasn't going to happen or it wasn't possible. Uh, I kind of eliminated and spending my time on those wasteful activities and became really, really efficient with my priorities on how things were going to happen. Now, real estate moves really, really slowly until it doesn't, right? It moves really, really slowly. And then all of a sudden you're, it's like, you know, race to the finish line. So it, it took us a little bit, of, a little while to get things going and to find the right property and to figure out exactly what made sense. Uh, and then it, and then things went really, really quickly and things continued to go very quickly. It kind of goes in, in cycles um, as does everything, but that really is still the goal. That is still the mission that we are on. And the only thing that probably changed from that was that I added in this, impact to other people, right? I have this knowledge. I have this experience. I think feeling stuck in a job and feeling married to that paycheck is miserable and is probably one of the worst places to be. And so having the confidence after doing a multifamily deal and realizing what I have to share and that I could help people and help coach them as well and give them options, give them options to get out of that nine to five if they choose to take the action. Um, that was probably the only other thing that we kind of added into the mix in along the way. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Uh, you've had some success and you quit your job and now you're helping other people do the same thing. And that's that's fantastic. Now, talk about some of the, the challenges that you had. And I, I know you talked offline about this idea of internal and external challenges. What were some of those and how did you how did you deal with that? So actually, hang on, I got to get to my notes here because I we could probably do a whole separate podcast on this. Um I have six things on kind of managing the internal versus the external. And I'll, I'll come back and kind of go through each one of these. One was what I touched on before is having something bigger than yourself to chase. Two is to train your mind. Three, to understand your relationship with money and your limiting beliefs, which was a big kind of exploration process for me. Four, you have to take action and you have to take action even when you don't know what the heck you're doing. Five is to hire coaching and six is coming back to the numbers. So I touched on having something bigger than yourself to chase. It, it has to be more than money. If you just get involved in real estate because you want more money, you're going to fail. I can damn near guarantee that one. You're going to fail. It's not big enough to keep you going through the process. So I, at a leadership conference a number of years ago, they actually told a very interesting story they did this study and found that humans cannot walk more than about 90 yards in a straight line. And this is why, and then you start to veer, you start to wander. And this is why when people get lost in the mountains, they end up walking around in circles and not even realizing it. And they did all these studies to say, okay, you're right-handed, you veer to the right, or you're left-brained, and so that you veer to the left, and none of that was conclusive. The only thing that they could find was that if you had a landmark or something off in the distance, you were much higher rate of success to meet your destination. You're still not gonna be on a straight path. You're still gonna wander. You're still gonna veer a little bit to the side, but you had a much higher rate of success to get there. So you have to have something in the long term that is keeping you on track because it is gonna to get tough. It is gonna get hard. It is gonna be scary. And if you don't have something that's keeping your distance, your focus off in the distance that is bigger than money and bigger than yourself, you're, you're not gonna walk that straight line. You're, you're not gonna make it. So that's number one. 
Uh, training your mind, I touched on. You have to take it to the gym. It's a muscle. You have to stop listening to that voice inside your head and start talking to it. And it, that's not natural. That's very difficult for you to do. And stop looking for a shortcut. There's no, there's no quick pill. You can't go to the medicine cabinet and pop in a leave and all of a sudden your mind is fixed. You can't do it that way. So stop looking for a shortcut. Understand that it's a process and engage in that process. And you know, the other piece of this is don't, you can't compare yourself to somebody else's path, right? And you can't compare somebody that is just starting out that really wants to quit their job. You can't compare where you're at in that point to where I'm at today or to where you're at today, because you, you didn't see all of the steps and all of the things that we went through to get here. So if you want to compare it, you need to compare it to where I was back when I first started and, and some of those things that we went to, but stop comparing yourself to other people's past. We all have our own process and our own route that we take to get there. Um, the other thing is just stop, stop listening to your excuses, right? We can all make up these really good excuses. Like I don't have time, right? We don't, we don't magically, those of us that are here don't magically have 27 hours in a day. It's a matter of how you use your time and you're not going to find the time. You have to make the time. If it's a priority and this is truly what you're committed to, you will make the time to make this happen. Um, you know, I'm too old or I'm too young, right? We hear this all the time and it's their lies. All of those things that we tell ourselves are lies. And you just have to make sure that you can eliminate those excuses and have some discipline around it. And just that undoubting belief that you are going to get to where you want to be. Um, number three I had was understanding your relationship with money and your limiting beliefs. So this was a really interesting exploration for me. I had never really thought about my relationship with money. Money is something that is not taught in schools. It's just a whole separate conversation. And I understand why it's not. I don't think it ever will be. But so it's a lot like religion within a household, right? You're raised in the Catholic church and you get out, you, you graduate college, you're out on your own and you don't even question it. You go to the Catholic church because that's all you know. And that's what you, you believe. And it's the same thing with money. However those spending habits are within a household and what you saw growing up is what you think how, how the world operates. And so you don't question some of those things and really understand that relationship with money. Um, Jen Sincero is the author of You're a Badass, which is a great book, by the way. And in this book, she suggests that you write a letter to money as if it were a friend of yours. And so interesting for me, I'm, I'm cheap as hell. I will, I'm fully cool with that. I am cheap. I don't like spending money. Uh, and if it were actually a friend of mine, I would probably strangle it. I want to hold on to it so tightly. <laughs> so I had to really kind of understand that relationship and that dynamic with money. And then my husband, you know, being the partnership has a much different relationship with money. He really likes to spend money. <laughs> he really likes to go shopping. Amazon packages show up here all the time. Um, but he does it in a very good way. So don't, don't let me mislead you there. But point being that him and I came from very different backgrounds and understanding and a relationship with money. And then you have these limiting beliefs that you've been telling yourself all your life. So I grew up in the small mountain town of Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and most people don't know where that is. It doesn't make the map. There's about 10,000 people in the town. So when people don't know where it is, I have to explain, well, it's in between Aspen and Vail. And Typically, the perception there is probably then that I was raised with a very silver spoon in my mouth, which was not the case at all. It was a very blue collar, hardworking, um, small business family that I grew up in. But as I look at my relationship and some of the things that the stories I've been telling myself over time from growing up in that environment is my perception was people in that area wanted to live in Aspen or Vail, but they couldn't afford it. So they lived in Glenwood, which was much more reasonable, but they didn't lose some of that rich, snobby, pretentious attitude that came with that. And it drove me crazy. So for a long, long time, 
I always thought that if you were very, very wealthy and you had lots of money, you had to be an And <laughs> unfortunately, that is a very common stereotype. But I also have proof uh, that that doesn't have to be the case. It's not mutually exclusive. The two can exist without one another. But I think it's important to go through and understand all of those dynamics and those stories that we tell ourselves and what you grew up seeing about your relationship with money and and how that how do you want that to be different and how that could be different going forward and then you utilizing real estate to get to where you want to be um and i'll speed it up here a little bit so the last ones i had were take action hire coaching and the numbers so you touched on it earlier that you have to take not take action you can have all the knowledge in the world but if you don't do anything with it it's not going to matter you know you have to realize that you're you're not setting out to build the wall right you have to set out to lay one brick at a time and just focus on laying that brick the best that it can be laid and if you do that over and over and over with that consistency pretty soon you're going to have the wall but you have to break that down and and just take little, little steps over time. And those little steps will add up and you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish over a year or two years or five years. Um, coaching, I think it's like a personal trainer. You're much more likely to show up at the gym if you have somebody that's there waiting for you. So coaching, I think, is invaluable. I think one of the most difficult things about finding financial advice is finding good, solid advice that isn't tied to someone's commission. I think that is hard at any stage of the game. And the story I tell here is my husband and I went out to dinner with a coworker of his and he's talking about a rental property, a property he used to own and then he sold it. And of course, now looking back, he wished that he would have hung on to it and rented it out. So we're having the conversation and I said, well, why, why didn't you hang on to it and rent it out? He said, well, my realtor told me to sell. And I, I, I mean, I was dying laughing, right? And of course, I don't think he even quite understood why I found this so humorous. And I said, well, of course your realtor told you to sell because if you don't sell, he's not going to get paid. So I think coaching is hugely important because you're not tied to a commission. You're, you know, your coach is going to be the one that pushes you to that comfort zone and then pushes you through that. But they're not going to get paid more because of it. Their success is directly to tied to your success. So I think coaching is hugely, hugely invaluable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, like I said, the numbers, knowing your numbers, knowing how to analyze a property, knowing if they make sense. Um, you can also get stuck in, as the real estate guys call it, the analysis paralysis. You can get stuck in analyzing the numbers and going through all those what if scenarios and still not taking action. So understanding the numbers, but, I think the biggest piece for me when I was going through this was recognizing that I didn't have to find the best way. I would get stuck sometime and try to find the best way to finance a property or the best way to make this make sense. I don't have to find the best way. I just have to find a way. And if I find a way to make it make sense, like I said, the numbers are going to strip out all of that emotion that you tie to it, that you tie to the money. And it's going to make it very, very clear on whether it's a good deal or not. But I, I overall, I cannot stress of how important I think that internal psychology is in common with managing the external to make sure that you're successful in, in whatever you do in your lifestyle. That was awesome. That was amazing. I don't have to put some that of the stuff. That was a lot. <laughs> we have to put this, this is great stuff, Krista. We have to put this in the show notes. It's going to be at the michaelblank.com forward slash session 207. We'll put all the stuff in the show notes as well. So that's good stuff, Krista. I really appreciate it. Take you, uh, taking for the time to really think about things that are keys to success for you and others as well. So that was really outstanding. Now I got a question uh, for you. We know that 82% of, I guess, the people in our ecosystem are men, and therefore a very small minority are women. And and, and I'm wondering if you can help me understand why there's not more men, uh, women in, in multifamily syndications. Uh, spaghetti, spaghetti and waffles which is probably not the answer you were looking for. <laughs> so and, and I don't know if this is part of the reason or not, but I, I, I think it plays into it and I think it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, a psychologist explained this to me years ago and it's how a man's brain operates and how a woman's brain, brain operates. So a man's brain is much more like waffles and you have compartments. So you have your, your work compartment 
you have your family compartment, you have your um, physical, you know, workout compartment, and, and your brain operates in these compartments much like a waffle does, right? And then you take a woman's brain, and a woman's brain is like a plate of spaghetti, right? All the noodles are overlapped and intertwined, and there's emotion in there, and you can't separate the work life from the family life and your investment life. And so just how we process information and and how we understand and operate in the world, I think makes a huge difference in when you look at multifamily investing too. And like I said, I don't know if that's like the end all be all reason why, um, but I do think it makes a lot of sense on how we interpret the world and how we process information in different manners. All right, we're gonna have to go a little deeper on this one. So are you, tell <laughs> are you telling me that you have a waffle brain or that you've been able to do the same thing using a spaghetti brain? Like help, help me understand why you were able to uh, be successful and then potentially how other women can do the same thing. Uh, you know, I would like to think sometimes I can operate in a waffle brain and sometimes I can separate that stuff. I don't know that I really do, but I think I have maybe some more awareness around the emotion and how it's involved. Uh, I do have sometimes a hard time separating all of those different factors. I also tend to be very analytical. So I think that helps me just in my personality to place a separation. And again, I'll go back to my numbers and my spreadsheets, right? I live, breathe, eat, excel. And I know that if I can, that helps me separate my spaghetti into a waffle. So I can look at all of those different circumstances. I can go through all of those what if scenarios and separate that out um, into that compartment to say this really does make sense and it's more of the analytical side. Uh, I don't know if that really answers your question. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just curious. I'm just observing, you know, what is and and I was just, you know, wondering why, why that is. It could be a cultural thing, could be a lifestyle thing. Um, yeah, I just, I think, I think it's a very interesting understanding on just kind of how our brains, our brains do operate differently being, you know, male versus female. And obviously that's not, that's not the only way there are people that operate on the opposite side, but um, I tend to be much more of the analytical business minded number focused but I also am the type that I, I am much more of a risk taker than my husband. So I am also the eternal optimist. I used to build these financial spreadsheets and you know think that everything was really, paint this really rosy picture and figure out a way to make these numbers work even if they maybe really didn't. And then here comes my husband who's you know very risk adverse, much more conservative, and he would rip those financials apart. <laughs> And it, at first it was really hard for me because I kind of took it personally, but it's actually really good because it made sure that I, I knew my business and I knew that if I could get my, if I could sell him on my financials and they made sense in his brain and he was on board with it, that I knew we were going to be okay. And I knew it really was a good deal and I wasn't making something happen that wasn't would, there. Would you consider yourself more entrepreneurial and your husband maybe less so? No, we're both pretty entrepreneurial. He, uh, he actually works at the IT business. He runs an IT uh, consulting business. He also has a fly fishing guiding business as well. Um, and he's a big woodworker. So he creates a lot of stuff woodworking and sells that as well. So we, we've got a number of different business operations within the household. I think I opposites attract. So I'm much more the kind of outgoing uh, people person and he's kind of describes himself as the quiet shy kid from the farm um, so I think we ha we do have that dynamic we are very opposite in a lot of ways but I think it's interesting in bringing that in to the role as well within the household and when you look at it stereotypically between a, a man and a wife I am truly the one driving some of the real estate investments and I don't know that that's normally the case um, within a household but Back to kind of your original question, besides the spaghetti and waffles, um, I, why they're not more women involved in, in real estate investments in general and also in multifamily. I think one of the things, in fact, I had a small group at my house months ago and they were looking at different coaching options that were out there in real estate investments and kind of getting comfortable and familiar in that realm. And one of the overwhelming things that came back was ego. 
for every single person in this group. And it was in a bad way. It was very, very apparent, very obvious in the communication and the messaging. Um, and it was very much a turnoff, particularly to the women in this group that they didn't want to sit and listen to someone talk about their ego for an hour through a podcast. And it, it really turned them off. And I will give you kudos on this because when I listened, when I first came across you um, and you were on the real estate guys and then listening to some of your podcasts, and I really commend you because I don't get that in a lot of your messaging and your marketing and from you in our communication, I don't get that at all. Um, so kudos to you on that. But I think that's a big turnoff for a lot of women. Okay, good. I appreciate that. Um, now you're having a conversation or, or, or a coffee with a friend, could be a woman or it could be a, could be a guy, but they're like really interested. Chris, I want to do what you've done. Now you went through some great stuff, but you only, you know, you, you don't have quite that much time, but what do you advise this person to do next? Um, there's probably three or four things that I would tell you to do. One is get a coach, mm. right? Get a coach or a mentor or someone that can keep you on track and also be the outside eyes that isn't tied to a deal emotionally. So get, get a coach to keep yourself accountable. Uh, get your mind right and work on that every single day and make sure that you're in the right place. Get your spouse, your partner, uh, your team, meaning you know investing is not a, an individual sport, it's a team sport. So get your team uh, in place and get your support group in place. And get all of those people, surround yourself with those people so that they're all aware and on board and can help you through, through the hard times. And the fourth one is just go, right? Just go, jump in with both feet, jump off the diving board. Um, if you don't make it, you know, there's a lifeguard there. They're gonna throw out the life vest. You're not gonna drown. Just go, even when you don't know what you're doing, just go. And you'll learn from that. You'll learn from those experiences and you'll adjust and you'll get better and it will expedite the process. It's outstanding. Krista, how can people connect with you? Uh, you can find us on social media. So Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you can find us. I'm under Synergy Invested LLC. So you can reach out to me there. You can book a call with me there. You can find my cell phone. You can find my email address. Call me, email me. I could talk about real estate all day long. Um, and clearly I love to help people as well. So if you want to talk about any of that stuff from analyzing a property to being a mom and driving investments, uh, managing tenants, which we also do any of those things, I'm happy to make the time to get on a call with you guys. Uh, Krista, you brought an amazing amount of value. I think, uh, I, I know a lot of people listening are going to be able to relate to you. They have everyday lives and everyday jobs and they're like, my gosh, you were able to do that. And you really focused on the mindset, which I really like some of the challenges. So Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. I so appreciate it. Well, that is some good stuff, right? So I hope you're able to keep up with that. If not, we're going to have it in the show notes, okay? So it's going to be themichaelblank.com forward slash session 207, okay? So if you're on, on YouTube, obviously, you can leave some comments and ask questions. You can also look at the show notes there. If you're on iTunes, look at the show notes and head over to michaelblank.com forward slash session 207 because a lot of great stuff that she shared with me. She really has a, a passion for understanding human psychology as do I. So one of the key points uh, that she, you know, we left with was four things. One is get a coach and it really helps with limiting beliefs and overcoming those Number two is work on your mindset. And I used to, for a long time, I used to kind of belittle the mindset. I was more of a let's get it done kind of guy. And I had glossed over the mindset. And it's so important because everything starts with your mind and as well as limiting beliefs. What are your limiting beliefs? What are your thoughts about money, about work ethic, about raising money? Like literally look at your limiting beliefs. And if you say to yourself, I can't do something, there's a limiting belief somewhere. And the question should become, how can I do something? And a coach or mentor can help with that. Experienced people look at you and they see things in you that you don't even see yourself. I remember this distinctly uh, back when I was raising money for, for single family houses. People said, you know, you can raise money for single family houses. I was like, I can? I goes, oh yeah, it's relatively easy. Here's you do it. I'm like, my gosh, maybe I can do it. And you start believing in yourself that you can do something. And that's kind of how it starts. And a mentor or coach, someone who's experienced can do that for you. And the third thing she said is, Make sure you have a support structure around you. And she mentioned her spouse and your team around that. And that's so important. 
uh, and her spouse is supportive as well, though I'm sure he was kind of the unwilling victim, as was my my wife early on when I came home and I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to pursue passive income full time. She thought I was uh, nuts. Now she's very supportive, but it wasn't one of those things where she goes, "Oh, that's great, Michael. Let's do that." There was a conversation to be had for sure. But number three is really building out your support infrastructure uh, of your spouse, getting your spouse on board. And also a uh, team around you. So that includes property managers, includes advisors, SEC attorneys, lenders, all those kind of things. And then the fourth thing is she said, just go, just do it. And I, I love that because we sometimes tend to be in this analysis paralysis. And I am all big believer for educating yourself, reading books, seminars, courses, boot camps. Um, but there are these things called, these people called professional students and that they just hop from one seminar to another seminar and never do anything. I know a couple of people like that and I smile and have conversations with them and I'm like, why are you still here? You know, shouldn't you be doing something with something? And it's like one of those things you can never really fully prepare yourself. At one point, you just got to dive in and do it and you're going to learn on the job. And that's really important as well. Um, if you are interested in mentoring, there's a few number of people listening to this going, I really value the mentor thing. Anything I do, something personal fitness or health or a new business, I want to surround myself with experienced uh, people who have done that before. Then, hey, check out our mentoring program. It's at themichaelblank.com forward slash mentor. You can schedule a free strategy session with us and see if that's right for you. It's not right for everybody. Uh, we want to make sure that you're coachable and you do the work because we know what works. And you're going to be working full time with a, uh, a full time syndicator, really one-on-one -on -one with syndicators, some people who've, uh, whose names you might recognize and they work for us and they're still syndicating, raising millions of dollars, but they're still coaching on the side. And we really have a system that uh, that works. So if that's for you, check that out. Go to themichaelblank.com forward slash mentor and, uh, and see if that's something that, uh, that you might enjoy might be right for you. So anyway, I hope you were inspired by Krista's story. I, th I think a lot of people can relate to her, uh, whether you're a stay-at-home wor working mom or if you have a full-time job, her demands on her time were so much and she overcame those and figured out a way to get out of her double two job and then her next step is to get her husband out of his job as well so he can fly fish full-time. That sounds pretty good to me as well. So anyway, I hope you enjoy that. You're inspired by that and follow Krista's, uh, Krista's advice and just go. All right, guys, catch you on the next episode.